One of the things, given how much the Arctic is changing, is to try and find a way to slow it down. And one of the things that we're looking at is, are there ways to encourage reductions in the emissions that are especially affecting the Arctic? Among those might be black carbon that occurs in high latitudes. It can come from uh, forest fires, so it might be that some kinds of forest management can help. It comes from the diesel exhaust of engines that are on ships and, and the power um, that are used for energy generation in some villages. Are there ways to either capture that with filters? Are there, uh, one of the things with uh, icebreakers that they've been talking about is switching to turbines and not using that heavy bunker fuel that puts out black exhaust. So one is finding out what all those emissions are, and then there's an effort underway to try and start a sort of voluntary registry that would try and encourage groups, uh, businesses and others, to limit what they do that is warming the Arctic. Um, one of the other things that really kind of interesting that's warming, that can warm the Arctic is how I, when icebreakers are used and how they function. If they break through springtime ice that is bright and reflecting sunlight, they will create a dark passage, they will break the ice into smaller pieces so it melts faster. Um, and so that'll allow more solar absorption, more radiation to come in and warm the ocean. On the other hand, if they go through in the fall or the winter and they break up the ice, at that time of the year, the ice is serving as an insulator. It's keeping the heat in the ocean and preventing it from radiating to space. That's why with thick ice, you can get down to minus 40 degrees or so, and yet you have two meters down, you have ice, right? You have water at zero. So ice is, being, is an insulator. So if icebreakers go through in the winter, and it's hard to go through two meter ice, but if you go through the thinner ice, what it will do is let heat escape from the ocean into the atmosphere and then from the atmosphere to space. And as you make the ocean colder, that allows more ice to form sort of later in the season. So that would be a way, for example, to try and encourage uh, ice buildup, just as reducing some of the heating gases or black carbon will tend to reduce the warming influence. So there are people starting to look at what you might be able to do in the Arctic to try and see if we can at least limit it a bit, given how much it is changing. Uh, we've had uh, quite a precipitous drop in Arctic sea ice this season. Uh, is that telling us anything, or do you think it's just kind of an anomaly? Uh, is it just part of the continuing uh, spiral downward of the ice, or, or what's your thinking? Well. Uh, a lot of focus has been on the area of the ice and how much there is, but what's also been happening is a thinning of the ice. And so uh, it's becoming more vulnerable in two different ways. Uh, this year there's been indications of storms occurring, um, and storms start churning up the water that churns up the ice and breaks it up, again makes it into smaller pieces and causes damage. Uh, we've sort of known that sea ice suppresses storms. That's what's protected the, the native villages that are built on the barrier islands. They depend on having sea ice there to suppress the storms so you don't have winter storms eroding away everything. Well, uh, as you start having more open water, that's a big heat source to the atmosphere. That has the potential to create, create storms. Uh, when you have lots of warm water, essentially, and it's relatively warm in this case, if you have lots of warm water, um, it can create storms and start to do damage. Uh, so, yeah, the ice has been going down for a number of reasons, and it is seeming that this is a mechanism we haven't been looking at before and that can sort of accelerate, uh, accelerate the loss and sort of delay the formation in the fall. Uh, and as you delay the formation in the fall, as you shorten the cooling season, the ice doesn't get as thick, it's then more vulnerable the next year. So it's a very serious issue. Just so I'm clear, do you think that the, the cyclones, we've seen two large cyclones in the last month that have had a big impact on, on the ice, and do you think that those are happening as part of this feedback mechanism due to the open water? Yeah, I'm not, I don't have a good history of exactly of summer storms, but I, I think the issue, I mean, I think what has happened when the 
in, in the past when there's been ice cover is you don't have these big storms. I mean, when you have big storms, what you need is a good sense of energy to help carry that air upwards. And you need that because air going up somewhere else, there has to be air coming down. And it takes a lot of effort to push air down because you heat it, you're compressing it um, and stuff. So it takes real energy to do that. Um, it's hard to get a lot of energy transfer from the ice into the atmosphere. So as you open it up and you, you have open water, which can bring heat to the surface by churning and mixing and everything else, uh, you're presumably adding more energy to the atmosphere and so you have more potential for storms. Uh, so this is a very interesting phenomenon that I think people haven't really thought much about. Um, it's sort of been the same situation on Greenland when you're melting that ice. People have sort of talked about just the heat transfer from the atmosphere to the ice. If that's the only way to do it, it's going to take quite a while to melt. But if the ice can move, if it can change in altitude and it can flow uh, and stretch itself out toward the coast and get in contact with the open waters, uh, then there's a potential for much more rapid melting. And I think that's what has many scientists really worried about Greenland. You've expressed some concerns about um, the low, uh, the, the, the level of the base of the ice below sea level at Greenland, on Greenland. Can you elaborate? Well, I think that, uh, I think if you go back 20, 30, 40 years and people realized the ice sheets could melt, if you go back to a National Academy report and the, and the Department of Energy report in the mid 80s, for example, the idea was that Greenland isn't very vulnerable. Greenland is a big island, it's got lots of mountains, the ice is piled on top of it. The only way you're going to really affect what happened to the ice on Greenland is transfer heat from the atmosphere to the ice. You don't have much time during the year, the air temperature doesn't get really too warm, so that's a hard thing to do. Uh, and everybody's worried about West Antarctica, which is a bunch of a pile of ice that is resting on the ocean bottom. And so that means that the the heat in the ocean could get at the ice and, and encourage calving and help carry away the melting ice and you could go much more rapidly for, for a number of reasons down there. And so that was the one to worry about. And that was what people were talking about as could cause rapid, contribute to rapid climate change. Well, it turns out a decade or so ago, uh, some researchers decided they would go over Greenland with a radar that could see through the ice and see where the land really was. Well, it turns out Greenland is really an atoll it's a ring of mountains, and the whole center has been pushed down a few hundred meters below sea level. Okay, so we've got this huge dip in there. Uh, that might not be so bad if it were isolated from the ocean, but there are a few places where there are fjords that reach through from the ocean into this depressed area. Um, that means that the ice is going to try and stream out those fjords. They're the low sort of part. It's going to try and flow out, and that's what's happened in the Jakobshavn sort of uh, ice stream coming, coming out, glacial stream coming out. Um, and the ocean waters carry much more heat capacity than the air. And so that means they can have a much more rapid effect. And so that means that the water and the heat in the ocean can get at the, uh, get at the ice. That's what's causing so much concern about a potential rapid rise. We're seeing melting of the ice. We're seeing it sort of flowing and going to lower elevations, which means it's it's, it's warmer, and it has these paths to the ocean where the ocean can get in and the ice can sort of move toward and get out. That's a very serious issue. Okay, uh, we're still in the midst of a historic drought over much of the United States. Uh, what can you tell us? Well, that the center of continents would dry is one of the very earliest projections that came out of climate models. It's something that Manabe got in his very early models back in the early 1980s, even the late 1970s. Um, so what has to happen to create precipitation is you have to have not only water vapor there, but you have to have some cold air coming that will trigger the thunderstorms and the convective fronts. If the Arctic is really warm, it's not putting out cold air. And so the cold fronts become weaker. And so even though you might have air that has some humidity that could lead to thunderstorms, you have to have something to trigger it to really get those storms going. And that, that seems to be happening less and less. 
it, it seems to me, I mean, my not a scientific observation, but just a scientist observing in some sense, is that the cold fronts can't, coming out of Canada are not as strong any longer and aren't making it so much over the Appalachians onto the Atlantic coastal plain. So all the way from the southeast and Atlanta all the way up to, to New York. And so the occurrence of thunderstorms, my just sort of reaction from what I remember growing up is that there are fewer occurring there are plenty of thunderstorms occurring in the Ohio River Valley still, um, but that cold air is less often making it over the Appalachians. So we're getting dry conditions because I think of changing air masses and changing locations of it. Uh, and it's hard to understand how one is gonna keep from having more droughts. If you think about the drought that occurred in Russia, how does the moisture get there? It can't come up from the south due to the mountains. It really can't. It's not going to come down from the Arctic just because of the weather and the warm air pushing north. That precipitation has to come from way over in the Atlantic coast and get all the way into Russia and decide to precipitate right there. That's going to be very hard to happen. That doesn't happen. What they generally get is a, a snow in the winter when some storms come over and then the snow water melts into the ground and that's the moisture they use through the growing season and then it evaporates through the summer. So where are they gonna get their moisture? They depend on snow. If you start changing the storm tracks, pushing things north and they don't get the snow down there, they're gonna be in serious trouble and we're gonna have more of these drought conditions. So it really is a result of the changes in the air masses and the weather that's occurring that, uh, and, and whether you can get moisture to those regions and have precipitation occurs when the moisture gets there. And that doesn't seem to be happening so much in the centers of continents. Briefly, one more thing. Uh, changes in the Hadley circulation were discussed yesterday. Can you describe that briefly? Well, basically what happens in atmospheric circulation is a lot of the solar radiation is coming in at low latitudes at the equator. That heat uh, causes the air to rise. The air rises and spreads out to the, into the subtropical latitudes and then it starts coming down. Um, when it's coming down in the subtropics, uh, that air warms and there's very little precipitation occurring. Well, as you get more energy and the oceans get warmer, you have the potential for intensifying that somewhat. And so those drier, those that Hadley cell, that descending air starts to spread out to a little bit higher latitudes. And that means you're going to get a, a sort of northward shift of the subtropics, the dry subtropics into the, into the U.S., for example, but in, more into middle latitudes. Um, that's sort of the way the thermodynamics of the Earth works. It's hard to avoid. Uh, the storm tracks get pushed a little bit further north, and you don't get precipitation on some of these belts and, unless it occurs in different ways. I mean, we're having some precipitation in the southwest now as the monsoon starts to occur. If the land gets warm enough compared to the ocean, it can pull air over it, and then if the air rises there, you get precipitation. But we're going to get changing precipitation situations, and uh, given that the water resource systems and the dams and reservoirs are all built for the older, but for the way it's been, it's going to be hard when it changes.